I think if you can name, hey, you know what? I never thought of saying this about Kurt Schilling, but he was kind of a WWE wrestler on the mound. <laughs> hey, Schilling was like a bulldog, wasn't he, man, on the mound? Opening day, I can't tell you how many times I would go to the old Yankee Stadium. I don't know if Kurt ever pitched in the old one because he was in the National League. I don't know if he ever pitched at the old one. The original one was like P yellow. And then the new one came up, and um, I used to go to all those opening games. The Yankees stunk back in the mid-'70s, too. They stunk. The Mets were the better team, actually. But opening day, man, there's nothing like it in sports. I still think it's the best ticket in baseball and truly one of the legendary guys in the history of the sport is our friend Kurt Schilling. He helps us here open up opening day in honor of it. Kurt, how you doing, brother? What's up, my friend? How are you? Good, man. So great to see you. Long time no talk. Is it still important opening day? In what sense? To the importance of the sport, or has it been diluted? Because oh. of is it been diluted? Because it used to be. Such a big deal. Right. Yeah, it's not what it used to be for sure, right? Because it used to be Cincinnati on Sunday. Yes. Right. And always and, Cincy. Yep. And then all that that entailed. Um, I think it's what's well, changed. Obviously, I, I, I don't know about importance. I, I, you know, I, I think it's, it. it I mean. We, True baseball fans, that's the day you wait for because, you know, in, in spring training, first day of camp, you ask every fan of every team, you're going to find some idiot that says, you know what? Yeah, the Royals have a chance to win it all this year, <laughs> you know, um, and it's kind of the beauty of the sport. And, and we've had enough instances of teams coming out of nowhere that everybody's, you know, in, in September, the last two weeks of the season, there's maybe eight markets watching baseball. All 32 are watching in April, right? All third, yeah. And so, I, I, you know, I, I, from an important, all 30, it's 30, right? Yeah, 30. It's going to be 32 soon, by the way. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's still got its thing. I like, I, I remember yesterday I was thinking about it, um, how different I, I was thinking about, I was sitting down in my barn with a lot of my baby chickens. And I was thinking to myself, wow, like life couldn't be farther. Because, you know, I got I had six or seven opening day starts. And, you know, that was when the, the, the you know, everything changed. You flip the switch in a sense. And so, you know, it was it was for me, it was it was the thing that kept me playing for 20 years, that pre that adrenaline. And it's also the thing that made me retire, which was that fear of failure. I, I, you know, I got eventually got tired of that. And, and, uh, I was thinking about it, like I said, when I was with my chickens the other day and I was like, my goodness, you know, I wouldn't want to be any place else in the world, but, but God, that was fun, man. And you gave us a lot of thrills. I mean, let me, let me take you to the Phillies here as they open up, they, didn't open yesterday, so they're opening today here. Let me ask you, you know, Kurt, when you look at winning a division, it seems that these guys are talking about wanting to win right. the National League East. Right. And yet you look at what the Marlins did. The Marlins have never won a National League East, and they've won two World Series, right. not having won their division. Is that a big deal or not a big deal? It's a Is big that deal a goal? until it isn't. It's a big deal until you can't, right? It, it's it, For a team like Philadelphia – uh, uh, Mr. Middleton, uh, the owner, who, by the way, is a phenomenal human being. Um, I said it, and I might have told you this a couple years ago. I thought the biggest offseason signing five or six years ago was Zach Wheeler. I thought I, I, I was in, I'm in love with the arm. I love the makeup. Um, but for the Phillies, it's about you want to get to the last week of October with a healthy roster and Nola and Wheeler at the top of your rotation. Because those two guys are that that changes the outlook. No one wants to play uh, either. No one wants to play the Phillies. And you know, I don't care if you're the Braves with Strider and whatever. You've seen wild cards. You watched the Diamondbacks last year. Um, get give me a hot couple starters, and and the thing changes. The Braves are just so good, and a lot of the same. They need to get into late September with Acuna healthy and 
and Strider. And, and I mean, Chris Sale's the big question mark over there. I uh, I think he's going to have a really good year. Um, but does a really good year him making 26 starts or is it really good year him making 14 starts, right? The, and the Phillies have the same kind of question mark. You always have question around pitching, but I love the Phillies. I love their makeup. Uh, I love everything about it. There's a there's a Bryce Harper to Philadelphia attachment that is just – he's the face of that franchise, and I think he's a good face. And, and I, I'm excited for Philly fans. Do you think they're a 100-win team? Yes. Wow. Absolutely. Why? Uh, well, I, I, I'll go back to it. Nola and, and Wheeler. And if, you know, you're talking two out of those five guys, but if, if, if any of the other guys, and they have the arms, Suarez and a couple other guys have the arms to do, if you get one or two other guys, here's what I would tell you. If the Phillies get 130 to 40 starts out of their opening day five, they have a legit chance. That means taking down the Braves, right? Oh, sure. Absolutely. They're going to have to. Um, but but that's, a, you know, if you go back eons, 30 years ago, uh, the 93 Phillies, we made 100 and I think 61 of 162 starts, just those five, our five starters. And I always say that's a metric. If you're going to gamble, you want to gamble on the team that's going to get the most starts from their opening day five. and and. You know, that I think they're in a position to do that. Like I said, I I, I have a couple prop bets on Zach Wheeler to win the Cy Young. Um, and, you know, you've got you've got your, you know, I can say this because I'm now canceled anyway. You've got your white David Ortiz in Bryce Harper, <laughs> um, who, who is not, you know, that, that that's a guy who was built to be at, at the plate in the ninth inning of a playoff game. And so, you know, it, it it's you definitely want to get in and you want to get into a series. You don't want to be the play in game or any of that crap, because then you spend Wheeler uh, on a game and you, it costs you in the postseason. But I, I love them. If Again, like everything else, if they stay healthy, I, I love them to be in the postseason. If they're in the postseason, all bets are off because they have the pitching to go. Do you think Trey Turner has to play MVP baseball for that 101 no. season? No, 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 no. Oh, hey, uh, 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 I, I got to tell you, that was one of my favorite stories last year in all of baseball. Um, the Philly fans doing something so unlike Philly fans. And, and instead of turning and spitting and throwing batteries at them, you know, be, and it, I think there was an enormous sea change because of that. Philly yeah. fans have always, and, and like Red Sox fans, like Yankee fans, they've always prided themselves on being dicks, right? They've always <laughs> prided themselves. That, and, you know, I know for a fact that they get into the heads of opposing players and for them to do what they did for Trey, number one, and then it was on him and he did that turnaround was awesome. And, and I, I those are one of the things that I hold dear and close to my heart about sports is that it gives you moments like that. And nothing else can. The bullpen, is it the best in the national league? No, it's April. They're, they're, no, here's the, here's the thing. No, and, and I say that with all the respect. Here's the thing. The one thing I look, well, in addition to many other things, I've watched in the last 30 years, Tampa Bay Rays and Theo Epstein taught me that you can rebuild your bullpen every single year and have an elite bullpen. If you go back and look at consistency, the, yep. the most inconsistent player on the baseball field is the relief pitcher. What, how else can you have Fernando Rodney saving 60 games with a 0 6 ERA one year, and the next year he's got a 4 ERA and he blow? you know? It, same stuff, right? So so um, that goes back. No team enters the season with a 25-man roster. If you're going to be in the postseason, you got to have 6 to 10 guys in AAA, right? 6 to 10 guys, that's where, that, that's where the GMs make their money. You've got that guy who he might be a 4A player, uh, but he'll take a split contract with you because of his chance to be somebody and recognizing, I mean, obviously a lot of it's changed now with the DH, right? Cause the national league doesn't have the, there's no need for the deep bench and the pinch hitters and all the things go with that. But if you look at the triple a situation with, with regards to pitching period, nothing else with regards to pitching, do you have five arms down there that you, because you're not going to have an 11, 12 man staff the whole year. You're going to have a 16 to 18 man staff. 
Do you have those three to five arms in AAA that can come up and get out in the big leagues? If you do, you're good to go. And then, it, again, it gets back to, you know, that that's cyclical. There's nothing harder on a team than losing a game in the ninth inning. Nothing. There's nothing harder on, on a team than losing a game that you have a late lead in the ninth inning. Those things, I can tell you, are, are the one, very few things I think in baseball carry over from a momentum perspective. That's one of them. Losing late game. Watch your, watch your, run, your one run score games, what the, what, the, what the difference is there. But watch, watch the lead on or after the seventh. If you start losing those games early in the year, you tend to not be able to get it back because now you've got six or seven guys down there without an established guy who's going to get the ball in the ninth inning because, you know, baseball's reinvented itself. You, you know, guys are bringing their clothes in the seventh um, to close the game and all the other things go with that. But when you have a bullpen that has some guys blowing it and the phone rings, everybody's kind of nervous about it being them. And that's, that, that's something that steamrolls and carries over. And that gets back to leadership in the clubhouse and, you know, I had some of the greatest leaders ever in the history of the game that that stuff didn't, didn't, wasn't allowed to happen. They stopped it. Kurt, you mentioned Theo Epstein and I happen to know uh, Dave Dombrowski from when I was down in South Florida right. at Larry yeah, Byfest Dave. down there. Yep. And I'll tell you something about him. You talk about a savant on talent, knowing guys, look at what he did in Detroit. Look at what he did in Boston. Look at what he's doing now in Philly. How important is a guy like that? That's just not an analytics guy. He, well, he he's he's a guy that looks at Dave pretty much Dombrowski everything. Is very old school, but he's the old school guy who bought into analytics. And and in my mind, he's the like Terry became Francona. You have to be a mix. Yeah, and I that was the thing for me. I still think Theo was the smartest baseball front office mind I've ever, ever met in by, by a wide, wide margin. And I can remember. Hey, Kurt, I like this guy, Andrew Friedman in LA now. Too. Well, yeah. Well, look what he did in Tampa, right? Yeah. This guy's a winner. He knows, he knows, you know, but that's a guy who marries the two play, the two things together. Yep. And, and, and for the most part, we'll give, you remember in Moneyball when, when uh, uh, Billy Bean came down and told Art how play this guy, play this guy, play this guy, start this guy. You know, I didn't realize that that was such a prevalent thing, but some of these teams have general managers going down to the manager and saying, all right, these three guys in the bullpen, not available tonight. And, and fans don't see that fans don't know that, but that, I think that's overstepping, right? I think because the manager, you trust the manager to translate the analytics. And that's what these new managers for the most part are doing. But, but, and Dave is an old school GM who bought into, okay, the analytics is going to help make me better. The difference is I've always viewed Dave as very scorched earth GM. When he leaves the place, they generally aren't going to be winning, <laughs> and, you know, because, and, and, you know, that's his right. He's getting paid to win. So those unbelievably talented A ball prospects who are four years off, they're, they're, they're just, they're walking dollar signs at the deadline for him. You know, he, he's going to move those those guys. And you look at all his old, a lot of his older trades. He's moving on some seriously talented young players because in his mind, they don't mean anything to me if we don't win this year. I'm losing my job. Why are the Braves such a dynamic organization? And, and, and Kurt, does it go back to the fact that they really don't invest in positional players? They I mean, they can move off of Freeman. They could move off of a Pendleton. They can move off of anything. But when it comes to starting pitching, man, they invest in draft choices, yeah. player development, well, all of that stuff. It just seems that that is the one difference between them and teams that spend money on position players. They spend it in the arms. Right. There's two schools of thought, and they're literally polar opposites. Theo Epstein, I did some stuff over the last 10, 15 years for the draft for a bunch of different teams. And I remember talking to Theo about pitching and, and Theo's philosophy eventually became, I'm not drafting pitchers. I'm going to draft the best, most pro ready bats I can find. And I'm going to buy my pitching. Let somebody else take the risk. And I thought that was kind of a genius approach. Now, if you've got personnel in place that no pitching, know how to scout pitching, and clearly the Braves do that and they have that, um, that's a constant, right? And, and so you play to your strengths. And, and ultimately, as a, a leader, your job is to put your people in the best position to succeed. 
So your baseball ops people, your scouts, you either put good ones in place and trust them or not. And, and you know, it's not a, it's no coincidence that for 70 years, the Cardinals, every player the Cardinals call to the big leagues is a professional ready baseball player, right? It, it, the Orioles for generations had the Oriole way. And, you know, a lot of teams understand. And that was the thing, like I said, that I, I saw a transition in Theo from, I think it was a very hardcore would a guy who might have just done the draft his first couple of years on analytics alone with I'm looking at players to to in 04 and then in 07 understanding there was a piece of this that they don't Yale and Harvard and Ivy League schools can't teach you about clubhouse chemistry and it's real and when they see that I you know they can't quantify that that bothers a lot of them because they can't put their finger on it but you saw what he did in Chicago he went and got David Ross Right. He did. And you saw in 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 nine in in uh, 2004, there were some clubhouse issues uh, with some players who were very ambiguous about whether they were going to play or not. Gone. Gone. Get rid of them and, and bring players in here, want to be here, want to play here, and all that other stuff. And then, you know, you, so you see that. I think you see that in GMs. And, and to this day, you know, I, I, I was around a lot of smart people. But as far as baseball minds. John Farrell and, and Theo Epstein were two of the, some of the smartest human beings I've ever been around. You know, you, you know, you mentioned something, and I'm very good friends with Gary Templeton. And when Gary Templeton was in uh, St. Louis and he came up through St. Louis, um, Kurt, he said when he got the A ball uh, with the Cardinals, then he got the double A, then he got the triple A. And when he got to the big leagues, he goes, nothing was different. They taught us everything about – clubhouse yep. um how you're yep. supposed to act as a cardinal yep. at every level like he goes some organizations today you'll have such a different dichotomy from a ball cook manager wants to do it this way then you have another at triple a you have a guy doing it another way he goes if you're really and he goes this is why houston is becoming because i forget the guy's name but he came down from st louis the guy that was just fired he ran Walt. Um, I forget his name. Walt. He was the Cardinal guy, and Doggedy? they implemented that down there in Houston. Was it and Doggedy? everybody um, had the same way? That's when you know you truly got a great organization. Well, see, that's, that's I've always said. I you give me a minor league organization, I can build you the deepest, most talented pitching prospects in history, because my pitchers when they get to the big leagues. The plate's 60 feet, six inches away from the mound. It's 17. Yeah. That, the only variable are the asses in the seats. And you that, that's, you know, that that's a plus. That's always a plus. But, you know, there's a reason why, the, you know, I've always said this. If you look around sports, and I don't have to tell you this because you've experienced it. When you look around sports and an organization like the Jets sucks for four decades, the players turn over every year. The scouts and coaches turn over every year. The only thing that stays the same is ownership. Look at the Red Sox. Look at the, uh, the Redskins. Dan Snyder turned that into an absolute cluster. And that's why they made mistake after mistake after mistake. Good. I'm a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, born and raised. The Steelers have been good for 50 years. And, and there's a reason, because the Steelers have the Steeler way. The the, the Patriots were, were became a team no one cared about in 2000 to every single human being on the planet outside of New England hated them because they won every year. And it was all about setting up uh, uh, an environment that all the athletes buy into. It, it's one way or the highway. And if you don't fit, you're gone. Hey, Kurt, and get this with you. Since you're a Steeler fan, think about this. I mentioned this yesterday to uh, Barry Switzer. And I said this because he brought up something about the Steelers. I go, there's been more popes and presidents since 1969 than the Steelers have had head coaches. They yep. had uh, Noel, they yep. had Cower, and yep. now they've got Tomlin. There's a reason why they've got the most Super Bowl wins. Well, I, I have uh, uh, Joanne Rooney is a very dear friend, and the Rooney's, uh, uh, you know, the Rooney's have always been about the Steelers. They understand the, the the point of pride that the Pittsburgh Steelers bring to that city, and they take it seriously. And you know, you know, God rest his soul, Peter Angelos destroyed the Oriole franchise. 
destroyed the or I thought what he did to that that franchise was criminal because you're talking about one of the best markets on the planet for sports and baseball especially and all he had to do was put a competitive team out there and they would have filled that place forever and Kurt, when I was a kid I don't ever remember the Orioles not being good and then when that guy took over he ruined them it was a shit show. Yeah, I mean, I them. couldn't believe that that's the organization of Ken Singleton and Brooks Ripken Robinson and Murray and, and, and uh, Palmer, Jim Palmer and all yeah, them guys. I mean, Quayar. Yeah. Embarrassing. It, it, it was embarrassing. Was completely destroyed it there. Let me, hey, let me, let me ask you one last Philly question here. Um, does it concern you? You're looking at a ball team that could possibly lead the National League in home runs, that that's where they get the majority of their offense. And that's not really a small ball team where they're going to manufacture runs. You're either going to knock this ball and make souvenirs, or you're not going to win ball games. I mean, they're well, a big fly team, Kurt. Right. Are you concerned? But, but if, you, if you have World Series expectations, they will figure out how to win small ball games. Okay. Right? Because, the, first of all, the, their pitching is going to keep them in, right? And so you've got a, 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 a bunting is is not a thing anymore. So, <laughs> but 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 running is yes. Stolen bases have gone through the roof. So you teach your pitchers that they you know holding runner. And the dynamics have changed so much. I don't with the way pitchers throw nowadays. I would much rather be a a a, a home run team than not. There there's no pitchers in the big leagues anymore. They're throwers. These guys are throwers and. When you have a thrower on the mound, you don't have to protect the plate until there's two strikes. I always look like against me, I, I, every pitch I threw, the hitter was anticipating a strike. So you think the art of pitching's gone? Oh, it's it's tremendously different than it was even ten years ago. Because there's a uh, there's a is that by design? Uh, I think it's by uh, the, the the focus on velocity has taken pitching away uh, from the game and. You know, if you if you all you have to do, if you want to understand pitching, watch the catcher's glove during a game. Watch how far he has to move his glove on fastballs. And 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 it's what I call command and control, right? Everybody in the big leagues, for the most part, has control. Control is the ability to throw strikes. Everybody can do that in the big leagues. Command is the ability to manipulate the ball in six inch increments around the strike zone. That's why Jacob deGrom was doing things no one had ever seen before. Because I always looked at him as he had as good a command as I ever had at a hundred miles an hour. And that's you can't you can't hit that. You can't defend that. That's not there's no there's no and you know pitchers when you see them nowadays. Catcher sets up on the outside corner, catcher catches the ball in the outside corner, or he catches the ball off the plate. He doesn't reach across to catch a ball in the inside part of the plate because the guy overthrew it. Kurt, um, I miss guys like you and uh, Pedro and guys like that where you owned half the plate. Batter owned half the plate. No, no I owned. All, see, I owned. In my mind, I owned all the plate. In in the <laughs> sense that, well, because I knew where. So you know, blue and red, right? Hot and cold. Yeah, I knew where all your blue spots were. And you know what? I could hit a gnat in the ass in sixty feet. So if your blue spots twelve inches by six inches, that's like trying to throw a ball in the tight and hit the Titanic. Yeah, right. You know, for me, in my mind, and so I'm going to keep throwing, and 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 it. You know, hitters are the dumbest athletes on the planet, and and uh, it takes them a while to adjust. And you know, professional athletes same way. You get to the NFL doing things a certain way. It's very hard to get off that or to be taught differently because you've always had success. It's a way. comfort zone, right? Right. And you know, Greg Maddox would win as many games today as he did when he pitched, and he's what throwing he the ball eighty nine ninety. Would he with the with the um, computerized home plate? Would oh, he yeah. still win, even yeah. though they took they they had a fatter black for him? Well, but hold on a second. He only threw, and I did the same thing. If you're gonna call a ball a strike, I'm throwing that pitch again. I don't have to have it, but I'll take it. Right? He if and that's why I said if they go to computerized strike zone, you will have seen your last 300 hitter. I don't think you're ever going to see a 300 winner again. No, 300 hitter. Yeah, but Kurt, I don't no, think you, you... no. I mean, Verlander. I think there's a couple guys with an outside shot, but but no, I don't think from from in this current generation of young pitchers, none of these guys are going to 300 games because none of them are so many more no decisions because you know they do go six and they're done and and you know 
it's not their fault. It's the, it's the game's fault. And, you know, I think it's lost one of our things that we grew up with, which was that starting pitcher matchup. Oh, my God. It's Ryan against Seaver. Well, now I've seen it's, that. It, oh, my God. It's Strider against Wheeler for five and two thirds. You know, I, 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 I'm, I'm with you. I have to ask you um, your opinion on Shohei Otani and your, your thoughts on um, Kurt. I got to tell you, and this is coming from a media guy. So know this. Yeah. Okay. This is a story that could either help baseball hurt baseball. Um, to me, is there too much outrage? Um, how do you see this game? He's not just a normal player. No. He's a world star because of the Japan connection he's, here. He might be the most talented baseball player that's ever I've ever seen. That's ever played the game. He's better than – Babe Ruth didn't do his pitching and hitting at the same time. He didn't. Right? This guy is – when he's on the mound, he's arguably the best pitcher in the big leagues that day. And when he's hitting, he's – one of the I've never seen players. anything like this. There's I mean, never been I think he's like the it. best ball player I've ever seen. And there's I thought never been, there's never been anything like it. Um, I got to tell you, I love the. I don't know him. I love the guy. I love everything about him. Uh, I have in my heart of hearts, I have absolutely unequivocally no doubt in my mind that that was his money yeah. and his, his gambling and his decisions. Right. His, well, I think he, yeah, I absolutely. You, there's no way. A bookie extends a four and a half million dollar line of credit to a guy making eighty grand a year. There's no way, and, and so you hear what Pete Rose said. Rose goes, "I wish yeah. I had an interpreter." Well, here's <laughs> the thing, you know, and 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 Pete Rose, Pete, whatever. The fact of the matter is, this, this none of this really matters if he didn't bet on baseball. If he bet on baseball, I could see baseball paying billions of dollars to not have that get out. Oh, so you think baseball's going to do everything it can to protect Shohei Otani? This is this is the biggest star in the world in baseball. One of the probably five most recognizable athletes in existence. Um, baseball has always been shooting itself in the foot when it comes to public facing decision making, um, and in this day and age, you know. And, but I mean, Pete Rose, listen. I don't know if the same thing in the NFL, but in every clubhouse I went into from the day I signed to the day I retired on the front door of every clubhouse from Elmira, New York to New York city was the gambling rule. There's a sign that has a football player that is in the doorway and it says gambling is prohibited lifetime in every band. single facility lifetime in band. the national football league. Yep. And, and so, and, you know, Pete Rose turned out to be kind of a degenerate, unfortunately. I mean, he was every bit that that whole Philadelphia thing when he came back, he could have done so much good and he He didn't work, work at it, did he? Well, Kurt, he's just, want to get back not, in. He's not a nice guy. I and here's the thing, I love Pete. I I roomed with Pete Rose Jr. We get was, him on here. And and I like Pete and I think Pete is one of the greatest baseball players that ever lived, but socially, he's just not a good guy. He doesn't you know, unfortunately, he Lenny Dykstra to me was 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 Pete in in many ways, and and I love Lenny to death. But socially, it's so uncomfortable. Who calls a woman broad? Hey, wait, Kurt, today? get this. My aunt doesn't really get in the way of guests getting on my show, and I've had him on. My aunt says that if that guy ever comes on again. She said she's not going to disown me because yeah. he was disgusting when he came on. Right. And by the way, I know Lenny. Right. I know he's just not a socially graceful guy. And if you don't, and no if you excuse. don't, if you know there's, that, you've got to tolerate that. But a there's lot of no people excuse don't. To, there's no excuse to talk to other human beings that way. None. None. And and like I said, I I love Lenny. I, I, Lenny was very good to me. Um, and you know, Lenny made his own bed and he's laying in it, you know, and, and all the things go with that. But him and Pete were very similar socially. Absolutely. Um, Kurt, um, predictions here a little bit here. Do you do that stuff when it comes to baseball or do Not, you wait no. to the halfway point before so, you really so, have, so I'll, I'll give, you know, I, I, I like to bet a little bit now and then. So I do a lot of prop betting. Uh, and I've actually turned out to be decent at it. I've hit some pretty big props. And, well, I'll just side note the year that the 
Patriots and Falcons played. I had preseason prop bets on Matt Ryan to win the MVP, to win the Offensive Player of the Year, on the Falcons to win the NFC, and the Falcons to win the Super Bowl. So at halftime of the Super Bowl, I was looking at about a half a million dollar payday. (laughs) And and I was in New England, so I'm kind of rooting for the Patriots. And then unfolding, I'm like, oh, my God, this is actually going to happen. They're going to actually lose this, you know. And but but I I don't know it's a, it's an like I picked the Lions uh I had a prop on the Lions to win the Super Bowl last year, um, you know I it, it's, and you've ha- I know you've had this. There's things that just when you see them your gut something happens. You're like okay, and I've done I feel like that with players. So yeah. you know a lot of, and you know a lot I did a lot of the prop betting this year uh, around that. But but you know the problem is that you know. Let's here. Here we are at ESPN. We're going to go to our DraftKings reporter to tell us about the Shoei Otani story. Uh, meanwhile, here's a message from FanDuel and <laughs> sponsored by MGM. And, yeah, uh, you know, hey, hey it, Kurt, I have to ask you this. Um, do you think your politics get in the way and has it gotten into the way of your relationships with some of the former teams that you performed with that, you know, because again, they're, they're a company that's there to try to, they're, they're companies of commerce. Right. And they always have to look at the bottom line. Right. And not so much at what's right and wrong. Yeah. So they may side on the side of money yeah. over right and wrong. And even though behind the scenes, they still may be your friend, but does it bug you? that because of the cancel culture today that you've been theoretically canceled in well, many aspects, you know, again, when this, I, I know they, that I've brought it up with you numerous times and you, you don't care because I think you've resigned to the fact of the hall of fame, but I mean, Kurt, you're, you, I mean, well, let's, hey, Dan, it, it, let's it, vom- think about it makes me vomit that you've but done and the accolades you have if, to where you are right now in your life. Well, think about this. If you go back to the beginning of this whole cancel culture, I was the kickoff. I was the first person. I was the first guy the cancel culture canceled because I had the audacity to compare uh, terrorists to Nazis. And and I said you had to have a penis to pee in the men's room. And I said Hillary Clinton was a criminal. I've never said anything racist in my life. And the players that I... Those things don't hide themselves in a professional athlete because you're in clubhouses. If you're that guy, if you're John Rocker, it comes out. And 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 the thing, so so the so in a sense, no, because all of the people that know me know me. I mean, the 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 prob- I've I've got a couple things I'll take to my grave. Uh, and and most assuredly, the situation around uh, the Wakefields uh, was devastating to me. Uh, and and because of what happened and how it happened, and you know, I had I, that was all, ugly, Kurt. Well, hold on. I was involved in in the sense that my wife and Stacy were communicating consistently, and I was talking to Tim, and I was I, I was texting him and talking to him, and all the things that go with. It. I didn't find out from somebody else. I had no idea that the people that in their lives that didn't know didn't know. None of that matters because that's on me. It's a hundred percent on me. And you know, they say the road to hell is paved with good intentions. You know, I had, as a Christian, as a man of God, I wanted a, a real quick story in 2004. In uh, before I went out to pitch the first bloody sock game, I had come down into the clubhouse and I was getting ready to go out the field, and I stopped Tim and another teammate, and I asked them to pray with me. Just not to win, but just to compete. I mean, those are the moments I carried with me. The thought that I might have caused even a second of discomfort or displeasure or anger in their lives, at especially at that time, devastates me. It's my, again my fault, hundred percent. But it wasn't what the media reported and the and the and the idiots of the world. You know, I just randomly did this. Why? Why? Why was? Why did it get taken so out of context then by others? Because that- of because I didn't come out to defend myself. Number one, and I wasn't going to. And number two, because of my political beliefs. I'm a conservative. It's open season on me. And, you know, people say, oh, you know, he, he runs his mouth. To my, I, I, I run my mouth how I want to run my mouth. I've never said anything racist. I don't do anything racist. I'm not homophobic. I'm not tra- any of that stuff. 
but you wouldn't know that if you uh googled my wikipedia page you know i mean it's 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 a uh, it's a concerted thing and i knew i knew i didn't realize it all happened when i when i supported president bush in 2004 the day after the world Series. that's when it all began um i didn't know that john henry and the ownership of the red sox would go to the lengths they did to try and make me pay for that um at the end of my career and i'll for you know i've forgiven them but i'll never forget what they did and and you know that to get back to it, I, I the 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 regret I have over possibly causing discomfort to the Wakefields at what had to be one of the most tragic times of their lives is gut wrenching to me, and and I'll take it to my grave. But I I forever uh, uh, I I completely one thousand percent know that there's not a chance in hell when you have a teammate and you have someone who passes away days later after you said that I knew right away. There's not a chance in hell this is true. It was taken out of context by the media um, idiots, especially the warriors on social media. I completely well, believed you 100%. Problem is, the chance. problem for me was, Dan, Tim was a very good friend of mine. I, uh, no, were, I've, heard, I the story, the I've heard people say that about you guys and that entire team. You know what Terry Francona told me? Terry Francona's like this, not a chance in hell. Car Schilling loved that guy. Right. There's yeah, but but again, you know, I said earlier, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Intentions are irrelevant. When you hurt someone else in 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 that sense, you know, especially somebody you love and you care about and you're friends with, I was devastated when when he passed, like everybody else. Um and I stayed away from the service for that reason, and that's why I'm not going to the ceremony this year, because I don't want the the ceremony to be anything but about the Wakefields in the 2014. How's your relationship with the Red Sox? Oh no, I don't have one. I, I haven't had one. I won't. I won't ever have one probably until the ownership changes. Um, like I said, they did some, may well, I ask Kurt why? Yeah, they they they. Uh, I don't know if you remember when Terry got booted out of Boston. They they put out rumors about his addiction to opioids and all this other stuff. In 2008, I signed in that offseason prior to them, and I was hurt. Uh, and they they tried to to tell me that that I lied to them and I got a contract knowing I was hurt. And then they threatened to do some of the things they did to Terry. If I didn't rearrange my contract and restructure it. And, you know, I sat across the table and, and, and looked them in the face and said, you know, you sit up here in this ivory tower, you have no idea the things that we do and the, 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 the sacrifices that we make. And, you know, three years ago, we were hugging in the locker room after the greatest comeback in history. And, and this is where I fall. You're going to do this to my family. Look them right in the face. Those cowards had not a single word to say to me in response. They didn't even say anything. And and I remember, I, I remember, I think, not being relieved, but knowing I felt like Theo was really upset about the whole situation from, he didn't think I deserved it. He couldn't say anything because he's the general manager. But, you know, it, 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 and again, as a, as a Christian, I've, it's, it was one of the things I realized I'm, I'm getting better in my faith. I forgive him. I'll never forget, but I forgive him. Who's who's kinder to you, the Boston media or the Philly media? Oh, both media suck. They're horrible. Both, <laughs> they're both, they're both, I mean, some of the worst <clears throat> hacks in existence work in those two markets. I mean, they they they're, they're the, and I know that because I'm on the other side of their lies. I know when they. That's how I know. I know when they write things about me if they're lying or not, and they lie. And, and you know, I realized that guys like Dan Shaughnessy and Marcus Hayes and these guys. They're the guys that use the anonymous teammate to make shit up. And and it took me a while to figure that out. But I hate those guys. Well, but here's the thing. Do you really think And I used to like Dan? Right. No, Dan's a, Dan's a, the first class ass clown. But but do you really think a teammate is going to confide in Dan Sean? No. No. And and no. the fans can't see that. As but you players, know what the fans know. think? The fans hear a guy go, I was talking to a player. Right. No, you weren't. Right. No, no it, you it, weren't because no, every player knows you're angling for a story. And if that player doesn't know that, you're going to know it real soon. Well, the problem is that the Kim Kirkton's and the Jason Starks of the world are so few and far between truly good hearted people who love the sport. And, you know, everybody, the, the transition became full fledged when the media started trying to become part of the story instead of report the story. That's right. 
And, and here's you're the thing. in broadcasting 101. It's another you're reason why it's another reason why the Hall of Fame thing doesn't hurt me. Dan Shaughnessy's in the Hall of Fame. I mean, I guess if I had a kid out of wedlock and and I lied about people, then I would be a character guy. Like that guy's going to judge my character. Give me a break. I can't stand that Boston media man. They, they... Well, they're 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 just they're just they're not good at their jobs. They're they're all and Boston is a shock market. It's about headlines. I mean, you look at some of the radio shows up there. Uh, I can't remember uh, uh, Tony Maserati and you know the, the, they're quote unquote experts. They're not experts at shit. I knew I know a hundred thousand fans that know more about the sport than they do. But people think since they're in the locker room, they're experts. Players aren't clamoring to speak to these guys. Yeah, absolutely, to. absolutely, Kurt. I love you, man. I want to thank you so much for yep. always finding time. Go back to the chickens. Have a great life, my friend. Hey. I love the fact you're yep. betting. Thank you. I love you. I miss you. It's always great to hear your voice, and you know I'm a guest anytime you want me for baseball. Thank you so much, Kurt Schilling. You are a dear and friend. Then, and then, hey, I'm going to hit you up before my fantasy football draft, too. Got you, my friend. I appreciate <laughs> you coming aboard. Thank you. The legendary Kurt Schilling. God, I love that guy, man. What an absolutely spectacular career. Do me a favor. Please hit the like button here.